Welcome back, everyone. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Force a habit. Run that back real quick. Welcome, everyone. Stage one, the day a new demon was born. So the episode begins by introducing us to our three lead characters, Lelouch, Suzaku, and C2. The scene doesn't have any dialogue, but still manages to showcase these characters' personalities, if not in a very truncated sense. The sequence displays both Suzaku's physical prowess, as well as his almost automatic willingness to help out his friends. With Lelouch, it gives us an idea of his tenacity, his unwillingness to give up, even if it means struggling. I also feel that it showcases his reluctance in asking for help, as Suzaku volunteered his hand, as opposed to Lelouch reaching out to ask for it. In addition to that, it also shows us his lack of physical ability, which will be a sort of running gag in the future. Now, lastly, in regard to C2, this moment sees her on the sidelines, a mostly inactive observer of the things happening around her, which is what we can expect to see from her more often than not. In addition to that, the scene also takes place in what appears to be a kind of peaceful forest on the edge of a town. It's definitely summertime, as made obvious by both the sunflowers and the chirping of the cicadas. In fact, in regard to the cicadas, the chirping is drowning out any sound of dialogue between the characters. And I bring that up specifically because it makes the abrupt silence that follows pretty jarring, as this armada of ships heads towards this area. Given their location in relation to Mount Fuji, it seems like they might have been one of the first areas ravaged by this invasion. So, if there was no forewarning about what was about to happen, this has to be terrifying as shit, which I feel the scene manages to showcase via the abrupt silence and accompanying visuals. We're then greeted with a bevy of exposition as our narrator, C2, explains the current state of the world, as a massive nation known as Britannia has laid claim to the country of Japan so that it can access its underground resources. Mostly, it's sub substance known as Sakuradite. The map does a great job of letting us know just how shitty this situation is, because essentially what we're seeing here is a third of the planet against a single island. Like there's only so much you can do against something like that. And while it's said that Japan put up a valiant defense, it was ultimately kind of pointless as they never stood a chance against Britannia's secret weapon. The humanoid autonomous armored knight known as the Nightmare Frame. And these things are cool as shit, especially in calling them nightmares. Like, that just seems like an objectively cool name for something like this. Not only are they piloted by knights, but mostly, but they're also the enemy's worst fucking nightmare, which this sequence does a great job of showcasing. These things are just wiping the floor with the enemy's ground forces. And I actually want to take a quick second to talk about the Nightmare's design, specifically the fact that these things have wheels in addition to legs, because it's such an interesting and effective design choice. Because a lot of anime mechs navigate by either walking slash running or using wheels slash tracks. Or if they're really advanced, they can fly, but that's not really what we're talking about, at least not right now. Anyway, what I think is really interesting is the choice to combine the first two, giving these machines both the ability to walk as well as wheels that help with both speed and agility. Like, look at the way these things just take off, just zipping from side to side. Like the way this one just moves around these bullets being shot at it, which then transitions to this shot of it just sliding around the tank before blasting it without so much as even stopping. And then you have this other tank in the forefront who's turning its turret to try and shoot at the nightmare that just blew up the other tank. But by the time it's able to spin its turret, it around, that nightmare is already gone. And that's when another one rolls up and takes out that tank. All of this in like five seconds. Like, damn. And hell, something else this points out is the fact that these things can operate on multiple terrains, both in the streets and out in the mud and dirt. It's an extremely versatile machine. Like this whole thing was already ridiculously unfair. And then they threw these into the mix and it's just, I mean, geez, man, RIP Japan. And I mean that literally. The country was stripped of its freedom, its rights, and its name. Area 11, once proud nation of Japan, was rechristened with a mere number. And it's wild. Like, to have your entire identity, your culture, erased and replaced with, what, a number? Because the people who live in Area 11 are no longer allowed to refer to themselves as Japanese. They're just 11s. Or, if they're lucky, they can earn honorary Britannian status, which means fuck all, as we'll soon find out. Anyway, in the aftermath of this conflict, we find our two leads in a vastly different environment. Gone is any semblance of peace or tranquility, now they're literally in the ruins of what they once called home, with dead bodies atop pyres because I guess there just aren't enough people left to even bury them. It's a complete juxtaposition. Their lives have been inexplicably split between the before 
and the after. And in this new hellscape, Lelouch tells Suzaku, I swear, Suzaku, so help me. I will one day obliterate Britannia. Anyway, we pick back up seven years later, and to give you an idea of just how quickly this war was fought and won by Britannia, C2 claimed that the war started in 2010. And here we are in 2017, seven years after the war, which means that the war started and ended in 2010, which is insane. But also, I mean, given all we've seen, it makes a lot of sense. Anyway, the view here is important to note as well, because we can see that this is still Mount Fuji, but the surrounding area is completely different, letting us know that a lot has changed in the last seven years. This place has become a settlement for the Britannians, and also honorary Britannians, which are essentially just Japanese people who've chosen to completely assimilate, even though they still get treated like shit in here. But I guess it's theoretically better than the alternative. Also, I wanted to point out something about Mount Fuji, specifically this structure that's built into the side of it. I never really thought about it before, but Mount Fuji, to my understanding, is a very sacred place in Japan. So the fact that the Britannians came in and just built this massive structure that covers like a fourth of the mountain is another indication of just how little they care about Japanese culture. Anyway, we kick things off with a chase of some sort, with some Britannian officers in pursuit of a truck. We then transition to a different location where a TV is on and a news anchor is saying, Here's video footage of yesterday's terrorist bombings in Osaka. You would think that this would be the primary focus of the scene, but it's almost entirely ignored in favor of reintroducing us to Lelouch. Whoa. This scene is set up in such a way that it really serves to bolster who Lelouch currently is. He's regarded as a student, but it's clear that he's got more than just that going on. I imagine there aren't many students playing high stakes chess with Britannian noblemen. Something else worth noting is that he has a very different atmosphere to him than the last time we saw him. He's not a kid anymore, or at least not as much of a kid. I imagine it's hard to retain any elements of one's childhood when it's literally blown to hell. But he's got a calm aura about him, which serves to juxtapose his more angry demeanor from seven years ago. Not only is he calm, he's also cocky as shit. When do you think we would have to leave in order to make our next class? 20 minutes if we bust our hump. Then be sure that you drive safely on the way back. All right, man, show me what you got. You start with the king. <laughs> I mean, why not? It's interesting that he'd laugh about that, because it's not like that's a stupid move. I mean, if I'm reading that board correctly, and full disclosure, I'm not some kind of chess master or anything, but if I'm looking at this right, he was one move away from being in check. And so, one of the few strategic moves he could make was to move his king and avoid getting trapped by either his opponent's knight or queen. So, it just seems kind of weird that this nobleman was laughing at him when it was literally one of the only moves to be made given the situation he was in. Like, what? And actually, it was bugging me, so I decided to look it up. Moving his king, followed by his rook, and then queen, actually made it so that he'd theoretically win in just three moves. So, yeah, moving the king seemed like the smartest move, in my opinion. Anyway, we transition from this match to a school, Ashford Academy, which is where Lelouch and Rivel attend classes. Here we see that some of their friends, a group of girls named Shirley, Millie, and Nina, <laughs> fucking Nina, are discussing Lelouch's penchant for engaging in questionable behaviors i.e. gambling. Lulu may be smart, yet he wastes his brain on stupid things. Oh, I wish my darling Lulu would be a serious young man. Please, Madam President. This scene at Ashford serves two different purposes. One, it gives us a better idea of the kind of company that Lelouch keeps, as both Shirley and Millie seem very familiar with both him and Rivel. Shirley even mentions him being on the student council, which confirms the fact that he definitely goes to school here, here being a far cry from where we saw him seven years ago. It's actually the second hint we're given about his ethnicity, the first being the fact that he was able to casually play chess with a so-called nobleman. And secondly, it sets Shirley up as a potential romantic interest given the way Millie teases her and she starts blushing. It also establishes the fact that she genuinely worries about him. More so than his other peers, it seems. As Millie laughs about the situation, Rivels is right there alongside him also engaging in the bad behavior, and Nina, <laughs> fucking Nina, doesn't say anything at all. We then switch back to the truck that we saw before as we get a glimpse of the two people driving it. It's all because Tamaki couldn't stick to Naoto's plan, and now we've got a problem! So, Two things about this one. One, without even having been introduced to him yet, he's already been confirmed to have messed something up off screen. Was it this? Was he responsible for the 59 people that died? Like, damn, man. And two, does this mean that he's partially responsible for Lelouch getting his power? Like, if things had gone according to plan, then these two wouldn't have ever crossed paths with Lelouch, meaning he might not have ever gotten his power. So, like, are we saying that Tamaki unintentionally started this story? 
Uh, anyway, Lelouch makes quick work of the noblemen, and then he and Rivals proceed to head back to school. The nobles are tepid. They're just overprivileged parasites, that's all. Now, while his rhetoric doesn't carry the same passion as when he was younger, it's clear that he still harbors some negative feelings towards the Britannians, at least the wealthy ones who profit off of what's been done to Japan. Why don't you challenge one of the Elevens? They're nothing like us Britannians. So, two things worth pointing out here. One, this confirms the fact that Lelouch isn't Japanese, but is instead a Britannian, which brings up a lot of questions. For example, if he's Britannian, why does he foster such a hatred for Britannia? Does he even still hate Britannia? The line that preceded this one conveyed to us that he's not keen on the Britannian nobleman, but it appears as though he, Revels, and those girls from school are all friends. So does that mean that he's given up on what he intends to do? Or is all of this fake? Maybe he's planning some sort of rebellion. Sorry, I had to. Secondly, despite Rivel seeming like a pretty cool dude, his rhetoric implies a certain level of racism, or at the very least, prejudice. And I don't mention the fact that it's racist or prejudiced as a way of somehow demonizing Rivels, because trust me, we'll see blatant racism in this fucking show in spades. But it's more so to point out the fact that he has this certain outlook because of how he was raised. Even calling them Elevens is just disrespectful as hell from our point of view, but he says it so casually because it's not seen as an issue. He's, what, 17 years old? And as such, that means that for about half of his life, he's been indoctrinated into this view of Elevens being lesser than. It's actually really interesting to see this sort of casual prejudice play out. And thirdly, I want to take note of the fact that Lelouch doesn't use that same rhetoric. So that's something, and I think it speaks to his experiences living with the Japanese before everything happened. Anyway, as they head outside, we see that the news broadcast from before is still going, this time on a big screen in a sort of plaza-like area. To all my Imperial subjects! I want to point out that we get an immediate change in Lelouch's demeanor just by looking at this guy. Though, to be fair, he looks like a douchebag. Including, of course, the many cooperative Elevens. We're not Elevens, we're Japanese! And this makes it clear what these people are truly fighting for. They're referred to as terrorists, but all they're trying to do is restore their way of life, something that was very recently stolen from them. Honestly, calling them terrorists for wanting their country back is just as bad, if not worse, than calling them Elevens. If anything, they're insurgents, not terrorists. Do you not see my pain? My heart was ripped from my chest only to be torn apart. Now this seems like it could be heartfelt. That is, until the camera stops rolling and you realize that dude could not care less about the common folk. It's all just pomp and circumstance and act. It isn't until the cameras turn off that he reveals how little he actually cares. Join me in observance of the eight who died for justice. Wow, I guess fuck the other 51 people who died in that incident. It was bad enough when they were referred to as others in the news broadcast earlier, but now you're just completely erasing them. Well, aren't you gonna join in? Aren't you? Spilling tears over those people won't bring them back to life, now will it? Doesn't matter how hard you try, you can't do it. There's no way you can change the world. So this sounds like something I would expect from a kid who's been through what Lelouch has been through. Like he has seen a lot of shit, and I imagine he spent countless days and nights crying over the things and people he's lost along the way. To the point where now he's just kind of aloof and despondent to death in the abstract sense. Furthermore, this, I feel, solidifies the fact that he still wishes to enact his plan of destroying Britannia, but he realizes his own insignificance in the grand scheme of things. At the end of the day, he's just a kid. Well, actually, I guess at the end of this specific day, he'll be a little bit more than just a kid, but we'll get to that. Anyway, we transition to Prince Douchebag after his speech, and honestly, this whole sequence is pretty gross. Not only was he faking all of that emotion, but he was also doing it while he was at a party. And part of me wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt, like maybe it's not fair to talk shit about him just because he found out about this news at a party. But then I remember the fact that the anchor woman said that the terrorist attack began yesterday and has been ongoing since then, which means throwing a party should have been the last thing this guy did. And yet, here we are. You were magnificent, your highness. Our key purpose in life is to support and assist your reign in any way we can. So this is showing us how people love kissing up to royalty typical. But anyway, off in the distance we see this dude, Detard, who's not engaging in any of the ass kissery going on on the other side of the room. He honestly seems pretty fed up with how things are going himself. However, when a soldier, a dude by the name of Bartley, comes rushing in whispering something in the prince's ear, it catches his attention. Especially after the prince responds by shouting, You fool! Deploy the royal guard! The nightmares as well! It's actually really interesting seeing him go from being practically indifferent to actively wanting to participate in the situation. He was fine letting the local authorities handle everything, but now that he's been made aware that they've stolen from him personally, he's willing to throw everything at them. I mean, it makes sense, but still, 
Well, fuck that guy. Anyway, after he gives the order, we get a quick montage of these two soldiers, Jeremiah and Valletta, getting ready to head out in their nightmares. Anyway, we switch back to Lelouch and Revels on their ride back to school. Why'd you start with the king? If the king doesn't lead, how can he expect his subordinates to follow? Do you fantasize about running a major corporation? I love how Lelouch is being <laughs> unnecessarily philosophical and Rivels just interprets that as him maybe wanting to own his own business or something. <laughs> it's hilarious. Anyway, all of a sudden the truck from earlier rolls up on our boys. And I mean, <laughs> what are the odds that these two vehicles would be the only ones on this major highway right now? I mean, like seriously. Idiot, watch where you're going. <laughs> I wonder if the irony of that is lost on him. Also, bro, were you even paying attention? Like there was clearly a barricade right there, man. Whoa, nasty crash. Hey, maybe somebody ought to go help. So everyone there is apparently subscribed to r slash don't help just film. Like, why doesn't somebody call for help, you know? She says with the phone in her hand. Anyway, Lelouch decides to take the initiative and go down to see if the people driving are okay. I will say that this says a lot about Lelouch's character. Everyone else, Rivals included, was fine with just just not getting involved. Lelouch was the only one who bothered to make any sort of effort in helping these people. So that's something. Anyway, Lelouch makes it to the truck and as he's calling out for anyone, this happens. It's you. Finally, I have found my... And before he, or even we, have a chance to really process what that even was, Nagata wakes back up and takes off, which causes Lelouch to fall into the back of the truck. Stop! I'm in here! As they say, no good deed goes unpunished. Also, that was surprisingly athletic for Lelouch. Anyway, as he's riding in the back of the truck, he hears the military calling out to the truck, letting him know that he's in, well, <laughs> quite the precarious situation. Give up now! We'll shoot to kill! Now what do we do? That's the army! Have you forgotten? That's what I'm here for. I've seen her before. So this is Colin, and while I don't have much to say about her right now, just know that we'll dive more into her character as the story progresses. I also want to take note of the fact that Lelouch says that he recognizes her, as that'll be pretty important later on. A nightmare! You fellas know full well what this badass mother can do! So we see that the Japanese have gotten their hands on a nightmare, and for a second it seems like she might really do some damage. But we quickly realize that, much like phones and cars, there are different generations to these things. I'll take this guy. And over the hill Glasgow is no match for a Sutherland! And from what Jeremiah just said, it seems like Colin's rocking the equivalent of an old Honda Accord, whereas Jeremiah is rolling around in a Rolls Royce. Well, maybe they're not that far apart in performance, but it's clear that she's outclassed. It's hard to really take a look at them when they're in motion, but here's a side-by-side -side comparison. With this, we can see that the Sutherland is a little beefier, with more armor on its shoulders and wrists, as well as armor that seems to kind of cover more of its elbows. The only other major distinction between them is the shape of the Nightmare's headpiece, with the Sutherland having longer ears or whatever you want to call them. So if we're going with the car comparison I just made, I'd argue the difference between them would be an older Honda Accord versus a newer Honda Accord. Which doesn't sound like much, but if there's a seven year difference between these two models, then that could make a substantial difference in performance. Like if we drop the car metaphor and used phones instead, imagine how much better performing an iPhone 15 would be in comparison to an iPhone 7. Anyway, Valletta pops up and cuts Nagata off, lighting him up and forcing him off the highway. Meanwhile, Colin's having some uh, technical difficulties. No way! It's stuck! I like this quick fight scene between Colin and Jeremiah because it serves a couple of purposes. One, it further shows us the difference in resources between the Japanese and the Britannians. Because yeah, the Japanese have a nightmare, but it's clearly, well, as Jeremiah put it earlier, a relic. And we can see that by way of it malfunctioning pretty much immediately after being used. Secondly, in regard to Colin specifically, it shows us how good of a pilot she is. Like even though she's not working with much and is going up against an elite pilot like Jeremiah, she still managed to hold him off. Even Jeremiah compliments her, saying that he likes her spirit. And she even managed to escape. Both her and Nagata escaped, actually. Which is kind of wild, considering the prince sent a whole military company after them. Huh, I wonder if that's an indicator of anything. But anyway, we head back to Lelouch, who's still in the back of the truck. Judging from the darkness and road surface, we must be driving somewhere in the ghetto. So something worth pointing out is that they brought up the idea of the ghetto multiple times. And it appears as though they're referring to Shinjuku. And it's interesting hearing Shinjuku referred to as a ghetto. Especially considering the fact that, in our world, it's a far cry from being a ghetto. 
However, in this timeline, it's part of the country that was ravaged by the war, rendering it from a bustling metropolitan area to a dilapidated and destroyed ghetto. Anyway, the scene switches back to Bartley, who's being <laughs> accosted by one of my absolute favorite characters in this show, Lloyd, and his assistant, the lovely Cecile. You really screwed this one up. So after Lloyd busts Bartley's balls a little bit, he tells them that he knows what they're up to, that it's not just a matter of retrieving whatever it is the insurgents stole, but also the fact that if they let them go, they can find out exactly where they're hiding. And that makes the fact that both Nagata and Colin got away make a lot more sense. Like I said, they have a whole military company on their ass, outfitted with multiple nightmares. There's really no way that they should have just gotten away. The only reason they did was because the military wants to follow them back to their base so that they can snuff them out completely. But anyway, Lloyd and Cecile tell Bartley that they're interested in assisting with the retrieval efforts, with Lloyd claiming that he wants to use the situation to collect data for something. It's then that Cecile asks what exactly was stolen, with Bartley responding with chemical weapons. In other words, poison gas. And welcome back to how to, oh wait, no, <laughs> sorry, wrong anime. All right, so the story picks back up in the remnants of what was once Shinjuku, and well, there's a lot to unpack here. For starters, this place looks like shit, and the reason I want to start by saying that is because this is the area right outside of the Tokyo settlement. You know, the place with the clean streets, luxurious schools, and futuristic technology. This is literally right outside of that area, and it looking like this is indicative of the issues that arise from being invaded by assholes. The Britannians put absolutely zero effort into trying to fix the destruction that they caused during their invasion. Instead, that responsibility is left up to the oppressed, while the oppressors sit in lavished luxury. Secondly, there's a voiceover during this scene, wherein a high-ranking military official informs his soldiers as to what their mission is. It's worth noting that they're sending in honorary Britannians to do this job, effectively ensuring that the Japanese are fighting amongst themselves. It's it's fucked up, honestly. The stench of these monkeys ought to be a familiar one. Damn, dude, fucking hell, like, my goodness. Anyway, thirdly, this has got to be terrifying for the people living here, because I imagine the last time they saw an armada of ships heading towards them was likely seven years ago, and what followed the arrival of those ships was, well, all of this. So this has got to be terrifying. Anyway, we transition back to Nagata, who appears to have actually been shot, and Oh, hold up, how is this man still alive? Because, I mean, think about how big the bullets in this huge ass gun must be. A bullet firing out of that barrel should have obliterated his shoulder, but instead, he just looks like he got shot by a handgun or something. That's, uh, that's a little silly. But anyway, Nagata ends up crashing the truck and in a desperate attempt to have someone find him, he opens the door to the trailer that Lelouch is in, which unfortunately catches the attention of one of the honorary Britannian soldiers, which means our boy might be in trouble. Well. Uh, more trouble. Now I can use this chance to climb up. Wait, what? Why would you climb up instead of just like, like walk out? Like the door opens and now you want to climb out of the top instead of just, I, what? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was that? Some dude's out here moving like a Power Ranger. That's enough mindless murder. Get off me! That's poison gas. It was made in Britannia, wasn't it? Mindless murder. Then why don't you just obliterate Britannia? So now we get to see the version of Lelouch from all those years ago. That anger, that passion, it's still there, but he's just smart enough to keep it contained. Well, kind of. Because in reality, this was actually really weird on his part, because saying, why don't you just obliterate Britannia, sounds like some shit a terrorist would say. Like that's probably the worst thing he could have said to a Britannian soldier after being discovered in a truck belonging to so-called terrorists, which is also housing a container filled with what is believed to be poison gas. Like talk about a lack of self-preservation. But anyway, luckily for him, the fact that he said that won't be an issue, because as it turns out, the soldier who just attacked Lelouch was none other than his old friend Suzaku. It's me, Suzaku. And while I would love to rip apart just how <laughs> random this whole situation is, I'm much more interested in the fact that this old Japanese friend is here acting as a dog of the military for these vile pieces of shit. Because bro, what? <laughs> However, that being said, I do think this reveal was handled really well. Because, I mean, over the course of this episode, we've gotten to know just how horrible the Britannians can be to the people they refer to as Elevens. So to now see Suzaku, someone we know saw firsthand just how brutal the Britannians can be, acting as a soldier on their behalf is wild. And it really kind of catches you off guard because you immediately have to wonder why. You became a Britannian soldier? 
Even Lelouch is surprised. Hell, I guess he, more than anyone, would be shocked to see this, seeing as both he and Suzaku experienced the same things back then, and yet they somehow ended up with such opposing stances. The Japanese boy is actively upholding the values that seek to subjugate him, whereas the Britannian boy would see the entire empire burn down. Anyway, it's at this moment that the container decides to open. And at first, I thought it was kinda random, but then when I went back over the footage, I saw that there were actually a few hints at this happening after Nagata crashed the truck. But yeah, something I wanna point out is the fact that even in thinking that Lelouch might be a terrorist, because really, all of the evidence points to that right now, Suzaku still opts to try and save him, even though it might mean sacrificing his own life. It's like I said earlier, he has an almost automatic response to helping out his friends. Anyway, with the container open, and we finally get to see what's inside. That girl is I mean, the jokes just write themselves sometimes. But anyway, looks like it wasn't poison gas, but instead, our girl C2. But yeah, just as they get her outside and on the ground, the other members of the military show up. Stinking monkey. Oh, come on. Literally the first thing you say is that? This is bad. In a situation which would pose a threat to Suzaku's superiors if it's unleashed. So I appreciate the show giving us insight into Lelouch's thought process. Suzaku doesn't seem to have realized it yet, but Lelouch is very much aware that they're in a very peculiar situation here, and things definitely go from bad to worse. In light of your outstanding military achievements, I'm going to be lenient. Take this and execute the terrorist. Anyway, the dude wants Suzaku to kill Lelouch, but he's not going for it. He's a civilian who got caught up in all this. You insubordinate little- I won't do it, sir. I can't follow your orders, sir. Very well. <laughs> it's insane that this man paid him a compliment and then, without hesitating, shot him in the back. It really speaks to how they view the Japanese, honorary Britannian or otherwise. At the end of the day, it doesn't make a difference. They're all expendable. But yeah, after taking out Suzaku, they turn their aim at Lelouch, and despite him being Britannian, they have no intention on letting him leave. Because, I mean, at this point, he's seen way too much. Anyway, while all of this has been going on, Nagata has just been in the front seat of the truck, sprawled out, slowly dying. But he ain't going out without a fight, and so he decides to just blow the whole damn thing up. Death to Britannia. Long live Japan! So I appreciate the show for illustrating the fact that the Japanese are willing to die for what they know is right. It's powerful and evocative, especially with the quick shot showing us what appears to be Nagata's wife and child. The fact that it's pinned to his dashboard shows us that it's a reminder of who and what he's fighting for. It really serves to set the tone for what we can expect going forward as things escalate. Now, that being said, I'm not sure how any of them were able to escape this. I mean, they say later that it's because the blast was pointed upwards, but I mean, come on now. That was a huge explosion, and you're telling me that they just walked away, practically uninjured. Okay. Anyway, we transition back to Prince Douchebag, who, upon finding out that they failed to retrieve what was actually in the container, says this. Destroy Shinjuku Ghetto! Leave no one alive! I'm sorry, what? What the hell? You're just, you're just gonna kill everyone. Everyone has to die because you fucked up and don't want to get caught. That's insane. That's, what the fuck? Dude's a fucking monster. Everyone taking part in this are actual fucking monsters. But mm, you know what? It goes to show you, again, how little they think of these people. They just don't care about them. Hell, I don't even know if that's fair to say because it's not necessarily even indifference to the Japanese. It's some kind of weird, illogical hatred of them. So much so that they laugh and chuckle and have a great time as they slaughter them. It's just weird. And it gets even weirder and more disgusting when you consider the fact that they're using honorary Britannians to help them do it. You remember honorary Britannians, right? Also known as other Japanese people? It's, I, ugh. and the worst part is, old Prince Douchebag over here is doing this because he's worried about being disinherited. But the thing is, the emperor already knows about, I, mm, whatever, we'll get to it. The enemy is garbage that can never hope to become even honorary Britannians. Bro, what enemy? Y'all are out here going after regular people just trying to live their lives. I mean, oh my gosh, they're sending waves of nightmares out to attack disabled people, children, the elderly. Like, it's insane. Just indiscriminate murder. Supervisor Jeremiah, General Bartley requests that you take command of Bartley Area 2. Bartley has Jude. staff officers. I haven't had this much fun on the front lines in ages. Okay, so while this whole situation is objectively dark, this part is actually 
hilarious. This guy's desire to wantonly murder innocent people is so strong that he unintentionally fucked himself out of gaining access to one of the strongest nightmares out there. We love to see racists cut themselves. Anyway, we transition back to Lelouch in C2, and he's, well, he's going through it. They even killed Suzaku! <laughs> this dude's having a seriously shitty day. I mean, everyone is, really, but, like, things have really escalated for this dude. He went from playing some chess to literally running for his life. That's... That's a lot. <laughs> the two eventually continue running only to be met with the same group of Britannians waiting for them at the tunnel's exit. But luckily, they duck and hide before they're noticed. Anyway, the Britannians are about to leave when... <laughs> that jerky hung up on me, I can't believe it! <laughs> it's so funny because she cares about his safety more than anyone, and yet she's about to get him killed. What an appropriate location for a terrorist to meet his end. <laughs> This is weird. Like, you had to have seen her approaching, right? Like, she's not the Flash. She's just a regular woman, for the most part. So, like, did you purposefully wait for her to jump in front of the bullet? I don't know. I think he honestly just wanted to kill her. Oh, well, nothing can be done about it now. Okay, man. For Suzaku's killed, and this girl, now I'm about to die before I've had a chance to do a single thing with my life. Not only... That's rough, man. Like, damn. The fact that he's already survived so much, and not just in regard to today, but throughout his entire life. To have gone through all of that and have it end because, what, you wanted to help some people out? Like, how crazy is that? This all started because he tried to do the right thing, which led to him basically being kidnapped. Then, against all odds, he was reunited with his long-lost friend just so that he could watch him get killed in front of him. Then, after that, he tries to save this woman, only for her to get killed trying to save him. And now he knows that he's going to be killed next, which means he'll be leaving behind the person he cares about more than anything. It's a lot. But... What if it didn't have to be like this? You don't want it to end here, do you? You appear to have a reason for living. So suddenly, C2 is back. Well, at least in his head. I kind of like the fact that his final thought before thinking it was all over was of his sister, Nanali. It's really because of that that this was triggered, I feel. The fact that there was something, or rather, someone that he wanted to live for. His reason for staying alive. But anyway, in regard to this next part, <laughs> well, there's a lot going on here. Like, things that are relevant to the series as a whole, more so than just this episode. And honestly, without diving deep into events that take place, hell, near the end of the series, it's, it's honestly impossible to explain this properly. But let's chop this bad boy up and see what we can explain. If I grant you power, could you go on? I propose a deal. In exchange for this power, you must agree to make my one wish come true. Now, this is simple enough. Right now, C2 is proposing a deal, or a contract, one wherein Lelouch receives a certain power in exchange for promising to one day fulfill C2's wish. What is that wish? Well, we'll find out. Uh, someday. The power of the king will condemn you to a life of solitude. Are you prepared for this? So this is C2 explaining to Lelouch that this power doesn't come without strings. Or maybe a better way to say it would be repercussions. She speaks of it being the power of the king. And that in and of itself kind of alludes to what we can expect from this power. A king is someone with absolute control, so in keeping that in mind, we can kind of surmise, at least somewhat, as to what this power might entail. Her mentioning the king is also important because it coincides with the chess motif from earlier, especially given Lelouch's insistence on starting his game off by moving with it, as well as what he told Rivals after the match regarding his belief in the king leading so that his subjects will follow. Now, lastly, and perhaps most importantly, is the part about solitude, and the fact that she asks him if he's prepared for the consequences of having such power and the solitude it will force upon him. Now, while he'll obviously still go on to agree to the terms of her contract, it'll be very important to remember this line, as it'll be a prominent theme throughout this entire series, really. Also, I do want to take a second to point out some of these visuals, specifically the mark of Gias etched into this stone, the children with Gias tattoos on their foreheads, kind of like the one on C2's forehead, as well as a shot of the planet Jupiter. And I know, none of that shit makes sense, at least not yet. But give it some time, we'll get there. A convergence with a Ragnarok connection, so the myth is beginning once again? No way in hell I'm touching that one right now. Not what he's referring to, or even who he is, because best believe we will get to it. What I will say though is 
Think about the term Ragnarok. Has it ever meant anything good? Well, outside of playing it on your PS5, but that's neither here nor there. Yes, I accept the terms of your contract! And just like that, well, a new demon is born. Now, upon snapping back to reality, <laughs> there goes gravity, we find that nothing's changed, and yet everything is different. C2 is still dead, and he's still in, well, quite the precarious situation. And yet... How should a Britannian who detests his own country live his life? Again, you sound very much like a terrorist, but <laughs> I'll let you finish. What's wrong? Why not shoot? Really though, why aren't you shooting? Why is this initial use of Gios so different from the ones that follow. Because he has these dudes in some kind of trance, apparently. So much so that they can't even move. Is that just how Gios works the first time for, for everyone? The only ones who should kill are those who are prepared to be killed. Ah yes, one of, if not the, most iconic line of the series. And throughout the series, we'll get to see just how much this sentiment rings true. I, Lelouch v. Britannia, command you. Now all of you. Die. So despite saying his name was Lamperouge before, he now adopts the name of his father and true lineage, letting us know that not only is he a Britannian, he's also nobility himself. A prince, in fact. And it makes you wonder what he's doing here. Why he's living the life of a commoner. Why didn't he just explain to these soldiers who he was from the jump? Hell, why was he even in Japan when all that shit went down? Well, all of that will be explained in due time. Happily, your highness. Okay, so uh, <laughs> that 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 was weird. Like he 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 didn't have to say that. He didn't have to smile gleefully as he pointed that gun at himself. That was what the fuck? Like this man was battling some demons, I think. Cause like we'll see later on that some people will actively fight against Gios at times, but this man was like just 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 happy to do it. But yeah, here's our first taste of Lelouch's newfound power: the power of the king. Gios. And what a power it is, honestly. The power to make anyone submit to and obey your commands. To the point where, with just a single sentence, he killed a dozen dudes simultaneously. Now, something I want to point out is right after these soldiers kill themselves, he has this moment where it's, it's kind of like he's come out of a trance himself. Like he has this intense look in his eyes while the Gios is active, but then he blinks and his eyes become rounder and softer. The first example that comes to mind is actually one from Death Note. Back in episode 16, when Light forfeited his memories and went from being Kidda to just regular old light. The way his eyes just shifted from being sharper and more rectangular to rounder and softer, it kind of reminded me of that. And in this case, after his eyes change, he kind of seems mortified by what he's just done. I thought that was kind of interesting. That was the turning point. Since that day, I've lived a lie. My name, my personal history, nothing but lies. I was sick to death of a world that couldn't be changed, but now this incredible power, it's mine. Well then. So this is the first of many monologues from our main character. This one does a really good job of just kind of summing up his life for the last several years. And it's interesting because I always thought the turning point that he was referring to was in reference to this moment. But when I actually listen to what he's saying, that doesn't seem to be the case. He speaks of both his name and personal history being lies, stemming from that day. But those things were in place long before this moment here. Lelouch Lamprouge is the name he's lived by for years, and the history attached to that name has existed for just as long. Furthermore, he speaks of how he was sick of a world that couldn't be changed, and again, that's been the case for years. So when he says that day, he has to be referring to something else. And I have an idea of what that is, but we'll have to dive into that at a later time. Anyway, to wrap this bad boy up, I want to quickly comment on his final lines, how he comments on the fact that he has this new power. It's interesting that this look of horror that he had on his face suddenly and swiftly changes to one of gleeful malice, letting us know that he's about to embark on a path of destruction, which I think is an awesome way to set up this series. And yeah, <laughs> roll credits. Anyway, that's the end of this video, but if y'all are hungry for more content, then come on over to the Patreon, because right now the videos for both episode 26 of Death Note and episode 2 of Code Geass are currently live. And speaking of Patreon, I want to take a second to thank all of the folks over there who helped make these videos possible. Starting things off, I want to say thank you to our five admirable assessors. I also want to give a big thanks to all 78 of our invaluable investigators. I'm probably going to need to go ahead and add a third page for y'all soon. 
But anyway, in addition to them, I want to shout out our six remarkable researchers. Arrow Falcon Green, Bad Wi-Fi Club, Game and Alchemist, The Best, Trinity Schiffer, and Vanellian. And lastly, praise be to our seven official overanalyzers. Asia, Cavarax XE, Seamart, Croy Raiden, Frigid Fox, I am the blonde asshole and Joey Helbig. I just want to say thanks again to all of y'all for helping make these videos possible. It really does mean a lot. But yeah, if you like this video, then consider dropping a like. If you really liked it, then consider subscribing. And if you just loved it and want to see more sooner, then consider joining the Patreon. Anyway, that's it for this time. Until next time, friends, peace.